Well, let's start with the last lecture today. Uh, I'm going to change dramatically my subject now. I leave this uh, social model. I'm going to speak about large scale, large scale brain dynamics from data networks and models. So uh, the idea here is what uh, I told you in the first class, how to model a complex systems. We have seen until now that we can use, how to use agent-based model to, to approach the understanding of complex systems. And I, uh, in this last lecture, I'm going to focus in how to use complex networks to analyze, analyze and model data. So this, it could be very relevant for two different problems like this. This is how we can analyze the collective dynamical property of a complex extended system, for instance. And here we have measures of uh, temperatures in the air, surface air temperatures in the whole globe. And here we have the activity the brain activity at a large scale a measure from experiment of a functional magnetic resonance imaging. So we, we, can, we will see that the tool that I would like to show you uh, that is very appropriate, very suitable for this kind of, uh, for study, this kind of are complex networks. So, I'm going to give uh, just a brief uh, introduction of some uh, particular uh, properties of complex network in order to, when I show you the observables, you, you can understand what I'm talking about. So a network is a set of nodes and or vertices that are connected with links. So we, uh, this is also called a graph. And we, when define a graph, we have to give the set of nodes that compose the graph and also the set of links that are uh, connecting particular nodes. So these are a 10 nodes representative um, graph. Another way to represent the connectivity pattern of uh, a network is, is given the adjacency matrix. I, I don't remember who asked me today, yesterday, I mean, how to represent, but this is a transition matrix. It's a matrix. I have 10 nodes. This is a matrix of 10 by 10. And this matrix is filled with 0 when I have no connection and with 1s when I have a connection between nodes. And this is because uh, um, an undirected network, this is a symmetric matrix. So this is the definition of the transition matrix. So when I uh, have a network, we can think about different kind of network. We, we, I can have unipartite networks in which all the nodes, nodes are of the same nature, but we also can have bipartite networks in which we have two different kind of nodes, a connection between these nodes. We are not talking about that, these bipartite networks. And the unipartite networks can be undirected and unweighted in this case, the matrix is binary, symmetrics, uh, the adjacency symmetrics. If we have undirected, uh, this should be directed, not undirected. If, if the network is directed and unweighted, the matrix is binary, but, but this is asymmetric. And this is the example of Twitter. I have a connection in, in a given direction, but it has not to be. Uh, there has not to be reciprocity. Also, I, have, I can have directed whited and undirected uh, whited. I mean, I also would like to put some weight on the connection to highlight the importance of some connection despite the other connections. And it could be represented putting different numbers in, in tens 0 or 1 in the adjacency matrix. One of the main properties, the first properties, what um, we analyze when we study the topological properties of a network is the degree of the 
of a given node or the, the, the degree distribution. The degree of that node is basically the, the, the number of neighbors of a given node. For instance, here, the node nine has just one connection, the node, the node zero have four connections. The degree of this node is four, and we, in general, one way to represent the pattern of connectivity of the, of the network is to give the degree distribution. It's, it's how many nodes are with the degree one, how many nodes with degree two, and so on. If we have a regular network, a, for instance, a regular network has a degree distribution which is a delta function. In a, a two-dimensional grid, it's a delta function in, in, in four because every node has four, four nodes. If we take a random graph, uh, the degree distribution is a kind of Gaussian, it's a, a bimodal distribution that in the, in the limit of n large tends to a Gaussian distribution that is like, like that. But we have to, we, several times we have uh, networks with a, um, heterogeneity in the degree distribution. As the degree distribution follows a power law, we say that this is a scale-free distribution. In scale-free distribution, I have many nodes with very low degree and very few nodes, um, very few nodes with high degree. I have highly connected nodes here with a very few, and a lot of nodes with little, um, okay? It's a power law, yeah. Another um, topology important measure is the clustering coefficient. The clustering coefficient is a measure of how locally is connected uh, uh, the network. And it's directly a measure of how many links exist among the neighbors of a given node. For instance, here, this is the node one. The node one has have degree four, one, two, three, four, and the neighbors of the degree four, the, the node one, are these green nodes. These green nodes has one, two, three, four links between them, among them, and they have four links among six possible links. So the clustering coefficient for this node is two-thirds. And it expresses, as I say, the degree of connectivity of the uh, neighbors of a given node. Usually, this is reported the average clustering of a network as a measure of the local connectivity of a network. So the high clustering coefficient, it means that the, the, the network has very, um, a lot of uh, uh, connection, you know, uh, local connections. And uh, the opposite, if we have a low clustering <coughs> coefficient. Another uh, quantity of interest when we measure, we analyze a complex network is what is called assortativity. Assortativity is a measure of the correlation between the degree of a given node and the degree of a neighbor. See? And some, sometimes it matters to know is large or low degree nodes are typically connected with large or low degree neighbors. It, it, the assortativity measures this, and the way one represents the assortativity is just plotting the average degree of the nearest networks of a given node. For instance, if I have this kind of networks, I have this node, and the neighbor, this is a high degree node, and the neighbors of this node are also high degree nodes. So that if I plot the average degree distribution of the nearest networks against the degree, I will see a plot like this. This is a sort of neighbors. Low degree nodes connect to low degree nodes, and high degree nodes connect to high degree nodes. That's our measure of the topology of the network. They may give me information about how is the topology of the network. And if I have a dissertative networks, I will have that low degree nodes 
are connected to high degree neighbors and vice versa. So the typical structure that have this kind of relationship in the sortativity is star-like networks. So you know? Exactly. It's a measure of the topology. Yes, we will see later that I can reflect the dynamics of a complex system in the topology of the network. Yes. Negative. No, no, it's starting one. The vertical axis. No, there, there has to be a mistake here. That, 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 that does not, that's not any sense. Okay. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you. So, this last lecture deals with this. Complex network as tool to model and analyze complex systems. And I will see two different approach. One of them is going to be how to use complex network as a, a backbone of multi-agent model. Yes? And in, in this uh, approach, the, the network has just the function of tell me how the nodes connect each other. See, the, he give me the pattern of connection. But also, we are going to use complex networks as a tool of mapping the whole dynamical state of a given complex system. And in this way, we call this kind of network functional network because are defined with the dynamical properties of the, of the network. And our idea is that the collective states of the whole system reflects in the topological properties of the network. And studying the topological properties of the network, I have an insight about how the dynamical state of the whole system. I mean, always in the idea that how can reduce the, comp the, the how can simplify a complex model without losing the complexity. So let's start with this. And again, our initial case of study, there are these different systems. Here, I will have temperature, temperature measure in this different parts of the globe. And here, I will have some uh, measure of the activity in different parts of the brain. Before starting, I, I, will, I will tell you that if we, I have to uh, measure the activity in the whole brain, I have to use what is called functional magnetic resonance imaging. Yes? You put your head here in this resonator, and this gives you an idea about how is the activity in the whole brain. But uh, differently than what Mauro showed, that it was directly electrical activity, in this technique, the, the, the measure is not electrical. This, this technique measures a signal that is related with the amount of ox oxygen in a given region of the brain. And the, the underlying hypothesis is that um, when, when a synaptic activity is taking place in a given region, it consumes a lot of oxygen and the magnetic properties of the uh, oxygenated hemoglobin is different from the deoxygenated um, hemoglobin. So measure this difference, it's possible to map or to have a report of the activity in single, in, in very tiny region of the brain. And the measure that we will have is that it's called the volt signal for blood oxygen dependent signal. We have in this type of experiment, we have a very high uh, spatial resolution because we have the activity in the whole brain. In region, it's about three millimeter in cubes, about three millimeter wide. That is called voxel. That is the three-dimensional version of a pixel. 
And uh, but the problem is we, ha we, we lose temporal resolution because the, um, the magnetons just uh, cover all the brain and they start over and they start over. And it takes about once in between one and 2.5 seconds to start over. So we are going to typically be here a signal uh, when the point has separated by about 2.5 seconds. This is the, the resolution of the uh, magnetic resonance apparatus. So, <coughs> when we measure the brain, we will have this kind of signals. If I look the signal in this voxel, we have this volt signal in this region, whether I, I'm going to have this and this in blue region, this one. And the same kind of data we are going to have if we measure temperatures, the surface temperatures in different parts of the globe. Yes? So the, the way the, the, this kind of data is presented is the same. I have an extended system. In each point of the system, I have a temporal signal. So can we, how can we analyze the emergence of patterns or the collective dynamics of time of systems when one approach is to calculate this functional network. How can calculate this functional network? Well, just looking for some measure of similarity between this dynamical activity. One, a linear one, is the, co the correlation coefficient. If I plot the correlation coefficient between those si two signals, if those, those signals are very correlated, this correlation coefficient is going to be one. If they are correlated, it's going to be zero. The same approach can be done with a nonlinear measure as, for instance, the mutual information. And I can calculate the mutual information between signals. And I, I can do this for both systems. So in both systems, I will have nodes that is in this climate-related problem, it's going to be a, the vertex of a, a, some point in the globe, in this two-dimensional map. And in the ball signal, it's going to be a single thin, tiny region in the brain. The links between these nodes in these functional networks are going to inform me, uh, give me information about some dynamical similarity between the activity in, in this region the same in the brain, but what it changed is the time scale in each one of these data, because here we have a, a data a 58 years. We have this kind of that, a data point with one month resolution. Meanwhile, the resolution in the, in the resonator is about 2.5, so I typically have a time series of 15 minutes, because it, it's, it, it's pretty odd to be there in the resonator. So people stand just for 15 minutes. And if I do that, as I say, the complete set, the, all the dynamics of the, the whole system, it's going to be encoded in the topological properties of this functional network. So if I know how to analyze, how to decode these this, uh, topological properties, uh, our idea is to understand how this dynamical collective behavior reflects in these topological, topological properties. This is just an example of this paper. Uh, in which they plot here, they, they made the functional network but the, for the surface air, air temperature. And here, what is mapped is the degree of, the, of each node. Do you remember what the degree is? It's the connectivity. So in red, there are the sides of the globe that they, they have much more connectivity with other points of the globe. And this is made by two different years, one during El Nino and one during the Nino. And what they say that is that 
there are regions on the planet that there are, I mean, if I have a region very connected with very high degree, my interpretation of this data is that these regions are very influential. They influence other parts. And this influence is, is bigger, larger, in, during, the, during La Nina than during, during El Nino. So this is a way to understand which regions are relevant for the global climate and which would be the difference between two, these two different phenomena. So we found that this way of representing the data can be useful to understand this non-local phenomena. I'm sorry for the people who is going to present, but this, it, it will be, it's going to be very, <laughs> very short. Uh, we, we, we can do the same for the brain activity. If I measure the brain activity, here, this is uh, uh, the activity of the brain of a given person when it's uh, doing, you, you can see here that this, this is, this is a signal of the visual cortex, this is a signal of the motor cortex, and this is a, a signal of the parietal lobe, I think. And they are different. They're different because when they present your, your work, one of the, the tasks they are doing is a, a finger tapping. They're doing this. And this I measure the motor, motor cortex, I'm going to see this periodical pattern that is related with the movement that we're doing. So it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, people can be in the resonator doing something or, or doing nothing. I, in all the cases, I, I will have, in every part of, the, my, reach, of my brain, a temporal signal. And I have a, will have a temporal signal between the end um, boxes of my brain. So I put end boxes here, end boxes here, so I calculate the correlation. If the correlation are high, it's, I'm going to have here a, a red color. If the correlation are, are low, I, I'm going to be here a low a blue color. That's okay? So the problem is that when I do this, I, the order of, I, I have a network of the order of about 100,000 nodes. So, if I keep this matrix with these values, I have a fully connected network. So, so I have to have a lot of links, about 10,000 to the square. So, it is a very, uh, very large data to analyze. So, many times, in order to simplify our, our problem, because this color are informative, it did tell me how uh, correlated this region, it's usual to threshold this matrix. I mean, to take some criteria of um, significant correlation. It could be an arbitrary threshold, or it could be some measure of significance against an, a null model. But in some way, I correlate, correlate uh, I um, threshold this matrix, and I say, uh, I, I go from this weighted matrix to this binary matrix, in which this connection tell me that these nodes are highly correlated. Just I classify the, the links between highly or nothing correlated. So if you have one are highly correlated, if you are above the threshold, there is no link between this node. And when I threshold this matrix, it appears like this. So I have a complex network with a given pattern of uh, information. How uh, can we, what can we do here? Well, one of the measures I was just telling this is the degree distribution. This is the degree distribution. It's how many voxels I have with degree one, with degree two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what I realize here is that the network of activity has this heterogeneous pattern of, of, um, of connectivity. And this is almost the, same, in the, almost the same independent of they are doing finger tapping or listening music. This is the paper of Calvo and Gilus of, from 2005. And this here, 
like the paper of, of Johnny's of the Clamide, is a uh, map the the node degree, the, the, the areas of the brain that are highly connected in one of these tasks. This is another work of 2008 of the group of uh, Paul de, on Banden, Banden Heuvel, and when he also uh, measure the topology of connectivity of the functional network in the brain, in this case are resting state experiments. I, 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 will, I will talk uh, uh, more detail about this, but resting state is when we enter in the resonator and just we do nothing, no, no, no specific uh, task. So I put there, I try to not get sleep, and during 50 minutes, I have to do nothing. If they analyze this data, they also see that this a power law distribution in the connectivity pattern. If they plot the degree of the, of the nodes in the brain region, they found that there are certain regions, the, like the anterior cingulate cortex, or the thalamus, or the superior temporal, and the posterior cingulate the region, they, they, are, they are highly connected. So there are, this is some way to, to see which region of the brain are uh, very influenced to the rest of the brain. The brain is the scale free network. Yes, there, there, there appear of a scale free networks in, in these cases. Yep. So, what what is entry, which is entry interesting in studying the resting state networks, in the, in studying the, the, the brain where, when nothing is, is uh, coming on, is nothing is doing. For several years, the typical study of uh, brain activity was experiment like this, in which <coughs> the, the experiment consists in proposing a given task for example, this is a person that is open and close their eyes. So there is sometimes the, 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 the eyes are closed and sometimes the eyes are open. And just to find in which part of the brain we have strong correlation with this task. So what it's found here, and it does a very useful thing that this task that is related to receiving information through the eyes or not is encoded in this region of the brain that is the back, is the visual cortex. So when we do this task, the region that is activated is the visual cortex. But if I put some people in the scanner and these people is doing nothing, what we think we see is this kind of signal. And this appeared as a non-informative signal. For many years, people thought that there was not information when the brain was uh, doing nothing. But the information is not in the activity. The information was in the correlation. Because when they studied the correlation between the ball signal, this almost noisy signal here, they found that the same kind of signal appear in other region of the brain. So this separate region have the same kind of noisy, of noisy behavior, and they, were, they are correlated. We can do this putting seed in see this just one part of the region when I, I, I look at signal, study the correlation with it with other part of the brain. If I put a seed here and I just watch which part of the brain has stronger correlation with the signal here, I found this. And if I calculate instead correlation, mutual information, I get also the same kind of pattern. I mean, there is similar activity between this region this is an univariate analysis, a seed-based interdependencies. 
but it's also possible to look at the whole brain and perform a uh, multivariate linear analysis. This is a principle independent component analysis. Just I look the signal of the brains and I de decompose in group of signals that are similar between them and different between others. And what we found here is what are called the resting state networks. I mean, there are regions in the brain that they behave in a similar way. So we have one resting state network related with a visual a part of the visual cortex, another with another part of the visual cortex, this one with the auditory cortex, the default mode, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have eight subnetworks of the brain that it's called the, rest, the resting state networks. And the property of this network and the brain activity in this region are similar. We are okay there? And why this is important? And this is a very nice paper because this guy, Beckman, performed the, 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 after detecting these resting state networks, he goes to a database of all the papers that was published with a, the other protocol, is activation, and he starts to mapping which a kind of region activate together in different experiments. For example, in experiment of, of a visual task, a, well, this, they report that this region activate together, and so on, so on, put every the data, and he also performed a principal component analysis about this data, data published in previous papers, and what we found here is that that region that used to activate together in task are also highly correlated in the resting state. So the resting state networks give us information about how regions are going to behave together when some action are required. So that's why important study is the resting state network. And since then, many people start to study the brain at rest because it was very informative about what would happen. So if we made a summary of experiment of resting state analysis, we will found that we have dense local correlation with few long range links resembling small world networks. Uh, we also find scale-free dependencies the connectivity of functional network. Also, we have large correlated domain which, which coexists with large anti-correlated domains. And uh, large scale correlated patterns are observed also during task or during rest. So this, as Mauro speak about in all the lecture, is what uh, as some people, um, the idea that maybe the brain is operating in a critical point of a certain phase transition. And uh, many people, in, in which I am included for some time, uh, dedicate our time to try to know if there is some kind, the, the brain leaves some kind of second order phase transition between an order and disordered state, as uh, Mauro told, told us very, uh, very well in, in, in his, his lecture. So, the first work what I did to test that this hypothesis is, well, let's, uh, how we approach this problem? Well, we can take a model that we know that is facing a second order phase transition. For physicists, this is the icing model. And let's calculate the functional networks in the icing model. And compare this functional network in the icing model with the functional network emerging from the brain. If the, I mean, this is not a hard proof, but 
is a, a goodwill uh, um, approach to know if this hypothesis can be true or not. So we take five subjects addressed. We take this bold signal for each of the brain region, and also we perform a simulation of a two-dimensional AC model. And we take the dynamic of the flip spin of every node. And we do the same procedure for both kinds of data. We calculate correlations between all pair of nodes. Yes. Yes, it's a metropolitan Monte Carlo simulation. Yeah. So when we did this, we calculate two kind of a uh, functional network: the brain of positive correlation and the red and the net, the network of negative correlation, which we 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 see that we have post as much positive as negative correlation, and we, we analyze these two kind of networks. This is a toy representation of the network. If we calculate the distribution of correlation, it's something like that in the brain, and this is, has this dependence of the, in, in the ESIM model, and this is the mean degree of the nodes, again, the, of the networks, the positive correlated network and the negative correlated network against the threshold I will use to um, define my, my network, I, I explained before. And in order to have a fair comparison between networks, we use different thresholds in order to compare network with the same um, mean degree distribution, with the same amount of links. And we, when we do that, we found this. The critical temperature of the ESIM model in two dimensions is 2.3. With um, in, in the subcritical regime, this is the degree distribution. In the supercritical, this is the degree distribution. But the degree distribution in the ESIM model at the critical temperature are like this. And in the brain, are like this. And this is for different thresholds, what in this notation means different mean degree of the networks. So we, we have we see this similarity. We, we are very happy. The same occurs with the degree distribution of the negative correlated um, network. And we also plot the assertivity, the mean degree of the native networks, and the clustering coefficient. And we found that both networks were very similar in different topological properties only when the AC model was in the critical temperature. So we, we take as, uh, as an evidence that the, um, the brain is operating in the critical point we was working in, in, in many o in others works. Some of them are, I'm not going to, to talk here, but this is um, a different approach. Uh, when was part of the PhD thesis of Ariel Movici, one former student, in which we we use complex networks, not as a functional network, but as the backbone of a multi-agent based model to study the same problem. What we did, what we did, we did this. We used some report of the connectivity of the brain, that is, the, Mauro speak about this, this, uh, I'm going to, uh, DTI, this is D DSI, it's not DTI, uh, and we use the connection, the, um, real connection between different parts of the brain, and we add some dynamics, and we would like to see this hybrid model. Opa. This hybrid model 
is consistent with what we observe in the experiment. So, the pattern of connectivity between different brain of different regions of the brain is what is called the connectome, and the connectome is obtained with the technique which could be obtained with DTI, or this in particular was with DSI, diffusion spectrum imaging, and they use the property that the water molecules diff uh, also diffuse more f faster uh, through the, the axons, the, the white matter in the brain, that is the axons, that is the, the fibers that connect different regions. And this technique is possible to, to report the density of connectivity between different regions. They, in these papers, they obtain two different patterns of correlation. First, they parcelate the brain in 66 regions, and then in about 1,000 regions, it's 1998. This is the 1998 region, and they track the connectivity between them, and this, like a pattern of connectivity like this. On top of this connectivity, this is the representation of the connectivity matrix in, in the brain space. This is the adjacent matrix, as I told you before, and this is the weight distribution because these are, are weighted connections. And on top of this, we put a discrete, discrete, discrete excitable, excitable dynamics in the same way that Mauro explained in, in his model. It's a, this is a cellular automata that has three states. Each region can, have, can be in three states. These states are inactivated, activated, or refractory. And if I, I have a, a node that is inactivated, it could be, become activated by two different mechanisms, just randomly with probability R1, that the one is a very, very low probability just to to avoid that the system goes down because the silent, the silent state is an attractor of the system, as Mauro explained. But also, if the neighbors of a given node fires and the weights and their contribution is above certain threshold, opa. then this node become activated, it's like making a spike, and then it's different with the Mauro that the refractory time was uh, set by a set of uh, uh, different state and it was fixed, it become also activated with a given probability R2 that we set in this, in this model at 0.2. When we analyze the dynamics of this model, it has a transition between an activated state, if the threshold is low, so we are firing, we have avalanches that uh, all the system is uh, active, but we increase the threshold, it's more difficult then to activate a given network uh, given the activity of the neighbors, and the, the system has a transition between an activated and deactivated states, and we plot the fluctuation of the distribution of the duration of the avalanche. It has a peak here that is the indicator that we, we have there, uh, the critical threshold. We can also measure the transition in terms of the topology of the biggest cluster of the activated uh, region, and this has um, this point. And the size of the second biggest fragment, that is a speculation indication of the critical point, has a peak in the same critical threshold. So we have a transition between an activated and deactivated state. If we look at the firing activity of the node, it has this kind of pattern. This is the raster plot as Mauro plot. This is for subcritical regime, for critical regime. If for supercritical, this we have some bars that is related with the R1 probability, and this is the mean activity, as we say here, and this is the power spectrum of the activity. If we plot the cluster distribution of the active sites 
we can see here. This is for supercritical regime. This is for the subcritical regime. And the, we, we have this power law like cluster side distribution for the critical point. And this match perfectly with we have measured in resting state experiments. Whoa, I'm pressing the wrong button here. So, how they compare the result of our model with some other experimental results? And the things that combines, uh, that make sure that we are doing the, the things in, in the right direction was that this model is able to reproduce this resting state network what's observed in the literature, not only in our data, but in many, many sets of data. These are the resting state networks observed in fMRI experiments, in a lot of data. And these are the resting state networks that we obtain with our hybrid model in the critical point, below the critical point, and above the critical threshold. And we can see we. Sorry. And we can see here that only at the critical point of the model, we have a perfect matching from our hybrid model it and the experiments. We also study here because we can analyze the correlation length in different subclusters of the brain and analyze how, how the correlation length scale with the size of the clusters. For those, you, you, you are laughing because, this, okay, this is common in, very, in, in much more system. This is a um, Dante Chialgo useful approach. Um, but it worked for this kind of data. And also the people that are going to tell us about the work of a bird's flock of Andrea Cabana are going to say that this similar scaling is present in, in these um, starling flocks. So we are, we are, you, you are going to find some common analysis here. And when we analyze the dependence of the correlation length with the size of the cluster, we see that the correlation lengths scale linearly with the size of the cluster as much for the model as, as for the experiment, for the model in the critical point. So this is two ways of using complex networks as well as functional network or uh, as a, the backbone of a multi-agent model that allow us to analyze the dynamics of a complex system of the brain and compare this and to test the critical hypothesis, uh, the hypothesis of criticality of the brain. Finally, I'm going to show you some results related when how can we use functional networks not to test the critical hypothesis, but to analyze alteration in connectivity given, a, given to some pathological condition. And this pathological condition is chronic back pain. We have data from some group of people that suffer chronic back pain, and it is known that chronic back pain produce cognitive alteration that go, goes beyond the, the pain. This produces depression, produce sleep problems, produce also abnormalities in decision making. So the people with chronic back pain has um, this uh, problem in taking good decisions. And also was reported some uh, difference in which region are activating in some particular region related with, with, with pain. And our approach was to know if these conditions 
are reflected in the pattern of connectivity of the functional network. So there is a, a change in the pattern connectivity of the network. So what we do here is analyze two groups of people, one suffering chronic back pain and a, a, a control group with healthy people. There are, the, this data proceed from experiment in people at rest, or in resting state experiment. And we are looking to uh, alterations at the global level. So the approach we take here is not to take the signal of each, bo of each voxel, but parcelate the brain in 90 anatomical region. This is a automatic, uh, a, a, the automatic level approach. And this different color could respond to different anatomical region of the brain, and we take the mean activity of each region as units of our networks. And after that, we calculate the correlations between all the signals for each subject. Then we threshold this matrix and we keep this binary functional networks that is made with connection with the highly correlated sites for each one of the subjects in each group. And then we do the same for all subjects and then we average this matrix in order to have two weighted matrix that represent the pattern of connectivity between ration in both groups. The, the weights here represent how many times two regions are, were connected in, in several groups. So the weight here gives me the importance of this connection in, this, in each group. So I have one weighted matrix for one group. And this is a representation of this matrix in the brain space. And what we do here is not to check to local or average quantities like a clustering coefficient or degree distribution, but what we look for here was for communes or uh, modules. It means if have I, I have a, a, a network with a certain degree of connectivity, it might happen that I have a group of nodes that are more strongly correlated among them while with the rest of the networks. And we can detect this kind of structure. This is called community detection. And one way to detect community detection is to maximize this quantity. This is a, a quality factor that basically tell me how this made partition on the systems calculate the average connectivity between all nodes in each one of the cluster of this partition and compare with what is expected is these uh, links are placed at random. And this, this uh, quantity has a, has a maximum. I, I, I said that I, I have this, the best partition in modules for, uh, uh, for my network. There is a lot of literature about how to use different techniques of uh, calculate uh, community detection. It's plenty. And if I do that, we found six main modules in each one of the group. And we can see as, um, just visually that this pattern of connectivity, this model, are not the same in the healthy control group that in the co uh, chronic back pain. And uh, this is the same connectivity, the, the same decomposition showing the, here in, in this brain space. And just here, just we analyze which, which type of uh, difference we have. We have, for, for instance, here in the Pareto temporal model that is blue in the healthy control model. This is not present, this model here in the chronic back pain group. It just is because 
we have a lower correlation here and a stronger correlation here that makes this module disappear. Also, we have that this big green module in, in the healthy control breaks in two different modules in the back pain uh, group, and this because this correlation are weaker and this correlation are stronger, and the same in, in, in other models, in sensory motor module that breaks some connectivity here in, in the frontal cortex. And this is anecdotal. Of course, I have a, another um, difference between them. But the point for this last lecture is how useful could be this approach for, analyze, for analyzing this kind of complex standard system. We have several tools at hand that we can use depending the problem we want to figure out. I tried to just make a picture about different techniques based in complex networks and in Asia based models. So this is the end of this class. I would like uh, the, the group of people that uh, works in this, uh, in this project, especially to Sebastiano, which was involved uh, in many of the works that is related with the PhD thesis. Uh, Federico Albanese, Juan Pablo Pinasco, Victoria Semeshenko, they work with me in the um, opinion dynamics and mass media influence uh, works. And I am not working nowadays in broadly related research, but much of this work was made with Ariel Movisi, Vanessa Tanglasucci, also with Dante Clairvo and Daniel Feynman. So thank you very much. This is all. So. Questions? Maurus. Um, I'm very curious about the last paper you presented about the chronic back pain, because once you see the change in the functional connectivity, yeah. especially after you post process it and find the new communities, different in how they're connected, <coughs> is it possible to then go back to the initial motivation, like, for instance, poor decision making? Yes. Can I somehow relate, relate yes. the, the changing activity with this kind of uh, yes. observed? Uh, I, think, I think it should be done. But we, we, yes, yes, we didn't do it. We didn't do it. I, I think it should be done. Also take into account that the, the size of the group is very, there are just 12. So if we, if we go back there and look at the prefrontal cortex, say, This? Do we know where it is? Yes, this is there. This is the, I think this is, this is, this is the visual cortex. This is the prefrontal cortex here, more or less. So it gets isolated? It gets isolated, yes. Yes, if then, you... Then, then again, you did this, I remember correctly, this, these are two groups in which every, uh, each, 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 of, each of these two groups, these two groups are this, average across subjects, right? Yes. But if you could do it subject by subject, yes. you might be able to infer, for instance, uh, the severity of the decision making, for instance, or any other thing. Yes, I think uh, so. To some mm. measurement from the functional Yes, uh, I, I think that the, the problem with this is the, the, what I remember, but there, there are many years that I'm not taking this data, but there is a strong variability, a strong individual variability. So make um, strong uh, claims about single individuals in this very short time experiment is, for me, it's risky. Yeah. You just take some, um, I know it's, uh, it, you, you don't want what's coming out of the data because it's so, 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 uh, so variable, but uh, you just take the data and some measurement from your function network and then you have some behavioral measurement or, or other kind of information, medical information. You just kind of plot it and see something comes out, I know. Yeah, but I, I, I have to, first I have to define, I have to, yes, in order to do that, I just to have this 
Yes. I, 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 this deserves a robust statistic, but I have to say this um, here, this subject has an alteration with this, uh, I mean, when some people, this is it's different, the distribution of healthy people with some people only. And for doing that, we have a lot of, lot of, lot of data to, to, to have stronger claims. So uh, I don't think it, it can be done with this, this data, but I mean, I, 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 this is 10 years ago. In 10 years, there is a lot of uh, uh, progress in this field. Yeah. Uh, I want to see if I understand this, this concept. So if you have a network where every node is connected to, to every node. Yes. But you have clusters that are synchronized and other ones that are having like uh, synchronic activity. When you do this function description, you will get a cluster with only the ones that are synchronized. Yes. So the topological subtype of the connectivity is different from the functional. Yes. And this, this, that's a very good question. And this is, this is here. This is a two-dimensional scene model. So the underlying structural pattern of connectivity is a grid. If I plot, if I plot the, the, the degree distribution of the connectivity, the connectivity, I will have a delta function here picked in four. So the functional networks are right here, and the long run connectivity is because the correlation length diverge. diverge. So I have long range um, correlation the between, in the dynamics that the they're, right? they're not connected structurally. That's why the functional networks is different from the structural network, especially if I have critical dynamics. Is it because the correlation length diverge? Yeah, I also have a question about this work. So it's, uh, I remember our current structure, which uh, this was like the now. Yes, me too. Uh, We didn't calculate. What? I, 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 we didn't calculate the exponent. We didn't calculate the exponent. Yeah, calculate it now. I mean, this is like yes. Right, I don't know, right? It yes. Can, it can be done. But, yeah. And, and, and I always thought that it might, I'm not sure, be possible to relate this. Because after all, I'm just calculating, summing all the guys, it's a mathematical distribution actually, on how many guys are correlated with me. Yeah. Above some degree, so I, I, I would assume that since you are at a critical temperature, that this exponent there could somehow be related to one of the critical exponents of the item. Or it could be yeah. Perhaps the one controlling the correlation length. Yeah. Which is yeah. New, if recognized with us. Yes, so it could be a good idea. We didn't do it in this moment. We calculated, perhaps. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Really? Yeah. It has, nobody has done it. As far as I know. Oh, maybe. It should be a, a very good exercise. So, uh, anyone else has a question? Yes. No. We, in the network, we, we simulate, uh, yes. We simulate uh, this um, excitable system, the Grimmer Hastin, that is a has a, also critical dynamics, but no days in model. But we didn't hear your question. Can you simulate the Ising model on top of the network? Yes, network? I can simulate the Ising model. I didn't do it. <laughs> oh, another one. Okay. Uh, on this work, did they measure or uh, suggested to measure the betweenness of the network? Uh, yes, we we, we didn't do it, flow? but we can we can do we can we couldn't do it, but we didn't do it. We we calculated the distribution, the clustering, yeah. the assertivity. Yeah. There are some 
we were so happy that <laughs> we stopped there. <laughs> Someone else? Okay, so let's thank Pablo. Okay, so after the coffee break, we're going to hang out for a little bit in case you want to discuss something of the presentations. And remember that the day of the presentations, you have to, to attend uh, your classmates' uh, presentations as well. So unless you are skipping one day, which we don't recommend, yeah.